Well, I just want to make sure that we're seeing. And then I'll, well, if I end stream. Yeah, if you end stream, you will remove that off of the page. Not yet. Can I pause the stream? Um, I think you have to go into like OBS to like pause. We have something a little unique this year. Um, we know that a lot of you are here uh, before doors open at 5 o'clock, and so you can uh, have your meal. You'll have a chance to converse a little bit. And uh, we thought we would bring in some entertainment. Uh, and so we're going to have a speaker this year who's going to speak on uh, things relative to our, our industry. Uh, Bill LeBlanc is our speaker. He's from uh, LeBlanc Energy. Uh, as, as his title says up here, he's the president and chief instigator. Uh, huh. What you should know about Bill is he's also a comedian. So I'm going to spare you uh, my comedy routine, which is normally really, really good. Uh, and uh, let Bill do that for entertainment. But just to give you a little bit of background on Bill, uh, he has more than 20 years of experience in strategic marketing. We've probably done the pricing market research on demand side management, as well as consumer behavior. Uh, he is focusing much of his efforts now on electric vehicle marketing as well as design thinking. He founded and served for several years as president of the Association of Energy Services Professionals. He also served in key capacities at eSource, including VP of Strategy and VP of Consulting, and VP of New Product Development. He also worked for EPRI, overseeing projects focused on demand management, rates marketing, and customer behavior. We're going to have to deal with feedback. Nate, can you bring the mic back up? <laughs> Got it? All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Yeah. You made it here before the storm, right? So what time is it, uh, will it hit tonight? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Not tomorrow. All right. So I'll be getting out of here by then, probably. So, yes, thanks for the wonderful um, introduction here, and thank you all for showing up. This is a wonderful treat for me. I love doing public speaking, and I like talking about energy, and I like people having fun and thinking about energy at the same time. So we will get into it. And the most important thing about this page is electricity is cool. It is. How many of you guys used electricity today? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, all right. I've got a lot more questions for you, too. So who am I? So if you went into Google and typed in Bill LeBlanc, energy, you might see me, you know, giving a talk somewhere. This was for a solar energy group in, uh, in Colorado. If you type in Bill LeBlanc comedy, you can turn that down just a little bit. Um, then you might get this picture of me where I was younger and way fuzzier, apparently, than I was before. And my background is I grew up in a small town outside of Kansas City. So I got a little more story about that. But um, I'm very, very familiar with gymnasiums like this because I was a basketball player for all my years in high school. And so I had a great time. Doing that. Uh, engineering degree. So how many engineers are in here? Got a, got a handful. Good. 
And I really paid more attention to um, marketing and consumer behavior because I think there's a lot of need that the utility industry has to get closer to their customers who are youth. So at my very first job, I was working for a utility out in California, and they had an agricultural program. And so we were looking for a project manager for the ag program, and they said, Bill, you're from Kansas. You probably know something about farms. And I go, yeah, but I'm not from Kansas. But you said you're from Kansas City, and I know that now I know how much you know about the Midwest, because I'm from Missouri. And they go, oh, then you still know the most about agriculture than anybody here. So I got kind of a very, very quick um, kind of um, going to school, so to speak, with agriculture in the Central Valley of California. And it was really interesting. So now I really like to think about what kind of big shifts are happening in the industry right now. And I'm going to try to talk about a few of those as we go. But since I told you about me, now I'm going to ask about you. This is, this is the time where you participate. And there's going to be some more time to you participate. There's a whole bunch of you here. There's like 120. I'm, I don't know how to count that fast, but I'm going with 120. So where are my uh, Packers fans? Keep it going. Packers and uh, Vikings. Houston and Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, Mahomes. Let's go. How many of you use an iPad? Wow, that's awesome, iPad. How many of you were born outside of Wisconsin? How many of you were born and lived in California for a while? So several of you. Anybody from Texas? Anybody from Canada? Just one from Canada. The rest of you, I understand why you didn't admit it. All right. Wow. How many of you have three or more on-road vehicles that you guys own in your family? Look around. Look at this. Three or more. All right. Good. How many of you have three or more but only two people in your household? Wow. All right. Who's driving the, the third one? I want to know. All right. Um, now, this is this is a quiz question. How much does a full-grown dairy cow weigh? How much? 1,300 pounds. Half a ton. So, 1,000 pounds. All right. I, I just didn't know that. I needed, I needed to know. And here's another question. How long is, you know, I went by the Mississippi River, and um, I was in New Orleans a month ago. How long would it take to float from here to New Orleans? If I just put in like a, a rubber ducky or something. Does anybody know? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it when the, when the snow melts. So I looked this up. It's about two months. So if you have that kind of time. And then uh, I love this picture of ice fishing. How many of you guys uh, ice fish? So, so I'm just... How much do you have to hate your family to take up that sport? Come on, on, guys. It's minus 10, 50 mile an hour winds, and you're deciding between staying home and doing that? This guy does not look happy. I'm not even sure he's still alive. So, what well, ice fishing in Colorado happens as well. Excellent. Thank you for answering those questions. So, when we think about electrification, and we go all the way back to the beginning of electrification, which I can see some of you were there. And uh, I know a lot of you. And so the first wave was really bringing the first electricity to towns across the United States. Of course, it started in the east. Of course, it started in urban areas. And then rural electrification happened all through the 30s. But the first thing that people did with electricity generally was replace kerosene lamps. It was a big part of it. And then that electrification helped people kind of get illumination. And 
then from that point around the 50s, there was an explosion of what I would call convenience devices. So these are all the things we take for granted now. So that's your washing machine, your dryer, um, television sets for the first time, black and white, of course. I'm sure it was exciting when everybody got their first color TV. But just the labor-saving appliances were a big deal. Vacuum cleaners, mixers, all of those elements came big time in the 50s. Then we got to the electronics boom, right? This is all of the stuff with microprocessors. A lot of entertainment, a lot of computation, a lot of TV stuff. And then we're still in this, so this is still happening. Along with that came efficiency. I'm not going to show you this, but if you look at the growth of electricity from probably 1920 to 1980, it was a pretty steep curve. And then it just leveled off. And that's because the electronics industry brought technology that used way less energy per device than in uh, years past. So this was a really interesting era that's still going on. Now we are entering this new era. And this is why your relationship to utility is so critical. So we're seeing a lot of firsts in the industry. So with all the communication technology we have, we're also seeing what we call distributed energy, meaning instead of centralized power plants, which have been around essentially the only method of creating electricity for 100 years, now there's people who are you know, creating their own energy through solar on their roofs. But there's also small power plants that are going in. There's wind power that's going in in dispersed ways. There's many more different types of power. But there's also the demand side of power, meaning can we help the utility by managing loads at certain times of the day and certain times of the year? Has anybody heard the term load management? You've been, you've been taught well then. So, so basically it's, can we manage the load to keep your rates down as low as possible and not have to build more power plants or more power lines? So you're in a very exciting time of the utility industry, and I'm going to be talking about electric vehicles because they're a very, very unique uh, technology compared to many other things. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this just to show you a few things that I want to point out. So um, these are the costs since probably around 2018 of all these different end uses. And I'm going to start with wind. So that's this green line here. So wind, since 2009 or so, the price has gone down about 67% in that amount of time. Solar, find the solar panels, this one has gone down almost 90%. Is that right? No, 83%. Coal has gone up a little bit. Natural gas has gone down 33%. Nuclear has kind of dropped down a little bit. But look where look where these two are. I mean, they're way down here. So as storage, as electric storage gets cheaper, you can combine wind and solar. It depends where you are. You guys are up here in the north and it's cloudy sometimes. But there's a lot of parts of the United States that get a lot of wind. And there's other parts that get a lot of sun. And in Colorado, we get both. So we're very fortunate. But you all have very low prices here as well. So that's a benefit to you. But super interesting just to see where all these costs are and, and why the, the, the whole landscape of the energy business is changing so dramatically right now. This is another indication of how generation has changed. So five or six years ago, most new generation was natural gas. You can see now almost well, two-thirds, maybe almost three-quarters, is wind and solar. And that's without rooftop solar, that's just utility solar. This is across the US. So you can double that, and that's remarkable. I, I would not have predicted that even five years ago, that these numbers would happen. It's because those prices have dropped so much. 
Now, I won't get into it, but there's, there's a lot in December because of production tax credits, uh, so they want to get credit for that. But wind has been the biggest growth, and now solar is kind of starting to take over. Now, this was a prediction of where electricity growth will go. Remember, a minute ago, I said things kind of flattened out around 1980. So, again, that's because of the efficiency. So, thank you all for being more efficient. And now it's taken off. And why is it taking off? It's all that growth is really electric vehicles. There could be some in heat pumps and some in electronics, some in industrial applications. But mostly, it's going to be transportation. You know how much energy transportation uses between your trucks and the buses and your cars, your tractors, and all that kind of stuff. So that's why we're going to spend a little extra time on electric vehicles. Um, now, I talked very briefly about beneficial electrification. I just wanted to find what that is. We wrote a paper about this so we could understand it ourselves. So this would be electrification that lowers the bills of the people who are doing the electrification. So for heating, by whatever it is, you're going to pay less on your heating bill or your cooling bill than you would have otherwise. There's the grid-efficient electrification. What that means is that when we do electrification, the pressure on rates is downward. It doesn't mean your rates are going to go down, but they're going to be lower than they would have been otherwise with that electrification. So that's why batteries are things we're staying with in the vehicles. And that pollution is lower. So we want that sweet spot where pollution rates and bills are all lower. That's what we're working for in the utility industry. And we have this new opportunity to do this. So now we have this issue. You know what that issue is? There's people involved. And you know these guys. Do you have friends like this? I mean, they... Look what they're doing. They're in the swimming pool on purpose with electricity. They won the Darwin Award, these guys. You know the Darwin Award? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. But this just is a nice picture because it says, oh, okay, people really love their energy. They'll, they'll do anything to keep connected to it. That is not a smart strip. So you guys have a lot of plug loads. Right? If you can kind of count up how many you have, I don't know what goes into your head. But we asked the question, this is something we're about, we asked everybody in our survey, how many gadgets do you have? These are things that are really entertainment and computing, right? And generally, independent of age, so between, we started asking questions at 18, because that's who we surveyed. And you can see that most people have between 30 and 40 gadgets in their household, except when they get to be about 81 and a half years old, Someone comes in and takes all their stuff away. <laughs> Has this happened to anybody yet in here? Where somebody came in and took all your stuff? Well, we have to watch out for that. So I don't know if that's coming soon to anybody, but I was a little bit worried about it. Except for that one 102-year-old person over there. He's got Twitter accounts coming out of his ears. So I don't know who that is. All right, thank you. So... <laughs> So I have been doing these uh, man-on-the-street videos, and uh, I don't know really how it started. We kind of just started interviewing people and asking them questions, kind of copied it from the Dale Leno. And so <laughs> I went out and asked people about energy. And hopefully this one will work. Let me test it in this format. So if you could control and, your energy using equipment with your smartphone, would that be a good thing? What would you control Oh, I, I think that would be a great thing. I mean, I've seen just through some uh, TV programs, homes that they have built that are all just controlled with the touch of a finger in the home. I uh, make sure I turn off my stove every day. Uh, Do you leave it on sometimes? <laughs> well, no, because I go back to double check almost every day. That sounds like a neat <laughs> idea, but that's fraught with complication and intrusion. The energy appliances could be manipulated from an outside source other than through my own electronics. Would you be interested in a two-way communicating thermostat in your house? Um, really? I just want a two-way communicating boyfriend at this point. Somebody <laughs> <laughs> get ready to come home from work and punch in and turn the air conditioner on and have the house full when I get there? Well, there you go. Now, now you know what's priority for people. 
So if you can think, we're going. So you all sitting there, you're watching me, and you don't know what's coming next. But you're going to do a little exercise with me. This is going to be really fun. And I've done this with other crowds, and you will learn a little bit of something. So uh, there's an organization that does what's called a customer experience rating, and utilities are involved with this. Custom, um, utilities really care about your customer experience. So they do a lot of work on it. And companies that I've worked for have helped utilities improve their customer relations. So they rate about 300 different companies. And I'm only going to focus on retail because we all know retail. And I'm going to have you put these companies in order of what you think got the best scores and what you think got the worst scores. Okay? I'm going to have you do this in your head for a second and uh, give you like 30 30 seconds to think about it. All right, these are the five companies. Home Depot, Nordstrom, Dollar General, or uh, Family Dollar, either one. Costco, or uh, Sam's Club is fine. And yeah, you know the rest. So just think about what you think's at the top and the bottom. That's the All right, now I want you to talk with a little group right around you, three or four people around you, and you, you'll you tell everybody what, what you thought the answer was, and they'll tell you, and then we'll come up with, and we'll vote. All right? Everybody, convince convince your buddies. All right, go. I haven't either, but I have to believe that that's all experiential sales. They don't have to do There's hardly anybody at checkout, and nobody comes and asks you if you need any help or anything. They just stand in the section. And this is remarkable 
people for years kilowatt for an hour and a kilowatt is the rate of uh, energy. How do you know that? Went to school. <laughs> um, kilowatt meant the they measure different things. Um, well, that, this is what you buy. Well, you buy these every single month and you don't know what they are? It's been don't a long you? time since I took physics. Don't you think you ought to know what you're spending $100 a month on? I mean, if you go into the grocery and you just bought a bottle and you didn't know what was in it, that wouldn't make any sense. True, but I know that if by paying my bill, I can turn my lights on and off and I can get water. How many uh, kilowatt hours do you use per month? Uh, what is the what? I would say that a kilowatt hour lasts about an hour. How long does a kilowatt last? Real quick. Split second. <laughs> Okay, I'll buy that. That's right. actually a pretty good answer. How many kilowatt hours do you think you use over the course of a year? Well, that's a ridiculous question. Um, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna ballpark it and go with twenty-five thousand. No, that doesn't even make sense. I'm gonna go with five hundred. Five hundred kilowatt hours per year. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you average the two, you're almost exactly right. That counts. That's like a B on a curve. I got a B in the, on a test that's graded with a curve. I would have just gotten a B with my two answers. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I don't think that that's how school works. But anyway, that was fun. 
And so that's just a kilowatt and kilowatt hour. Does anybody here know the difference between a kilowatt, a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour? You don't need to. That's what the utilities are for. Figure that out for you. All right. And now I finally found someone after all these years that I asked this question who could define a kilowatt hour. So here we go. I've been asking people for years what a kilowatt hour is, and I think this guy finally nailed it. Energy per second is measured in watts, but then when you multiply the rate of use times time, you go back to energy. So it's like saying like the distance from my house to the store is like 25 mile per hour minutes. 25 mile per hour minutes. Is a distance, right? Well, that's really stupid. It is, so a kilowatt hour is similar. I've been asking people. All right. So, so I'm going to go into some customer behavior stuff, and I probably won't be able to get to all my slides, but um, one of the reasons that behavior change is hard is because we, as humans and as animals, um, get into habits. And habits are there to save us energy and time and thinking with our brain every time we drive from our work to our school or whatever it is that we're going. And, and once you get into habits, you can see the neurological, the networks kind of get hardwired a little. So that's why it's hard to change. So people like what they're doing. And businesses get into habits as well because I work a lot with utilities who are a little resistant to change. And so we have to know that and acknowledge that that's a thing that we're all built um, built upon this premise of habit. So, you know, there's a lot of study of how, how things can shift. And right now we're shifting transportation if you're going to electric vehicles, for example. I'll get to that. But in general, there's kind of these three or four, five, six things that keeps popping up as people think about designing behavior change programs or trying to get society to move in one direction or another, such as it's to stop littering. So the practical value is what we all think about, what our heads think about. Is this something that makes sense financially for me? So first is social currency. And this, this is kind of like um, you know something that other people don't know. And I have this picture of pickleball. Anybody play pickleball in here? Yeah, I picked up pickleball. And it doesn't take very long to learn the game. But the people who have been playing a month or two months end up having social currency compared to the people who just walked onto the court. And they're like, oh, you know how to score. You must be awesome. And so it depends on what your group is. So if someone has an expertise and everybody looks at them, the, your status kind of moves up and down based upon how you're seen in your milieu, what's called a milieu. I just think that's a really interesting element of how people see themselves within a, with, within um, a behavior element. Uh, I like to use this, this was probably 15 years ago now, where the Prius and the Honda Civic hybrid came out, so probably 18 years ago. And Honda thought that people wanted a high mileage car, and Toyota thought they wanted a a status symbol, uh, an environmental status symbol. And guess, guess who won that one? So the Prius ended up, you know, being one of the best-selling cars of all time. So it's because people had an emotional element to the Prius, and they wanted to show people that they were environmentally um, savvy. And so that kind of now turned into Teslas. And so you can see what's going on in California pretty clearly. And this is data from, you know. Like the onion. <laughs> it's definitely accurate. It's estimated to be accurate. So I thought this was pretty funny. Oh, I forgot the punchline. <laughs> there you go. See? So remember this campaign? Who remembers this campaign? Ryan the Indian. What was it about? Literally. People. So when I was growing up, pretty much. When we had a wrapper, what did we do with it? We're driving down the street. Driving down, we threw it out the window. It was just, there was litter everywhere. And so there's a huge campaign, huge campaign. And this one kind of, but remember, this is, this is before seatbelts, right? So 
little kids, some three years old, four years old, were sitting in the front seat of your of your car, right? In the front. You know what was there instead of seat belts? The windshield's good. Yeah, my sister hit that. But your mother's arm would go out like this, and then you get burned with a cigarette, didn't you? Right? You know that's bad. You know that's bad. But we change over time. It's just a slow change. And I like this because in Boulder, people think it's okay to dress like this in the store. It's never okay to dress like this in the store, especially with those khaki shoes. Because on your left, on your left, every time they go in with their car. So, so we have to deal with humans. I took oh this God. picture right out of the parking lot today. It was flashlights. Which one of you has the flashlights in the car? All right. Yeah. You saw it? You saw it. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying here. All right. So innovation is not only difficult in our industry, it's difficult in a lot of areas. So I love this picture. So what, what's this about, this, this suitcase? How long did it take to put wheels on a suitcase? It's like 100 years. We had the wheels. We'd already invented the wheels. We had the suitcase. It was like, mm, let's put them together. It's like Reese's, you know, Reese's suitcase. What's this one? Cup holders. Your cup holders in 1968 in your car? No. That's like seven dollars, but this is what people were talking about in the eighties in their minivan. Soccer mom just bragging and says, "I got six cup holders." Whoa, that's amazing. And then, then, then that's what differentiated the vehicles. It's incredible. But why did it take so long? What about the ketchup? How many years did we hit the glass bottle on the bottom and just boom, boom, boom? All you have to do is stop for a minute, watch people use stuff, and then you should be able to fix it. Remember this? I don't know if these are still around. This is my grandma's house. So it's you know, have a freezing cold or boiling hot, washing your hands, and so you got this, this bottle. People figure out workarounds. And ultimately, when we want to design, so I do a lot of work on design, is what does this say? This says, sit back. Watch before you build something. So as an engineer, someone gives me a problem, I want to start solving it right away. So I've learned over time as a designer to wait and watch. And that's how I'm helping utilities uh, kind of move through the design thinking approach is through the findings. And I just point this out as Airbnb was trying to solve an interesting problem. Anybody know why it's called Airbnb? The air part, air mattress, started out with an air mattress. Just, and so they were having trouble getting traction, and they finally figured it out after they talked to some people. I says, why would I stay in a stranger's house? I get to kill me in my sleep. <laughs> Which is the worst way to sleep, frankly. Because when you wake up, you're dead. <laughs> I've never had this happen. So Airbnb had to figure out how to design for trust. And they did this in the most interesting way. We learned this a while back, Design for Trust. They had to move people on the internet from thinking that they're staying in a stranger's house to one that's at least as good as a relative or a friend so they could sleep there. Right? Think about that. And the answer was, after about 10 people wrote on the internet, I hope they were real people, that they stayed there and did not get killed in their sleep, then people felt comfortable doing it. What they didn't realize, the people that were reading it, is that anybody who was killed didn't write up reading that. <laughs> right? I mean, this is just logical. Thank you for sticking with me on this. All right. I'm going to give you... What do you think? Yep, that one. Yep. Um, electric transportation. All right? So, how many of you own an electric vehicle? So a pretty good number, because on a percent basis, that's not too bad. How many of you have ridden in an electric vehicle? So quite a few of you. Great. All right. So there's a lot going on in the electric vehicle space right now. It's getting a lot of attention. Um, F-150 is something that we're watching. It could be a game changer. 
that it can help power your home in some cases. You can put, uh, you know, your power tools, plug them in right there. So it's a very, very nice vehicle. But what we have to remember is only 1% of cars on the road across the United, whole United States are plug-in electric. And half of those are in California, and most of the ones in California are in urban and suburban areas. So what I tell people is don't expect the market to be mature because it's not. That's okay. Some people just have to wait until it's time because there's not enough charging up there yet, but there will be. And here's Pepin is working on that very aggressively right now. So we have to kind of think about the adoption curve. So all technologies go to the adoption curve. There's the people who, they can they like to take risks or they like to show off that they got the latest technology. But what we're waiting for is for the mainstream customers because that's when the numbers get big. And we need to really focus on these early adopters because they're willing to pay the price and then those will become used cars and they'll go through all the growing pains so the other people don't have to. Because there's a lot of people who aren't risk takers. A lot of people can't afford a new car, they buy a used car. So understanding this diffusion curve is really important. <coughs> Early adopters are kind of change agents, risk takers, they might be working for prestige or they want to be out in front on renewable energy or the environment. And they have money. They have their they have two cars or more, those types of things. And it comes down to risk. So this is me <coughs> taking a taking a picture of a guy who's taking too much risk, <laughs> right? And so there's there's a limit that each of us have on what we will do. Uh, let's get that one. Now this goes back to your utility. When you get an electric vehicle, we're really encouraging everybody to get onto a utility program that will help you keep your costs of charging as low as possible. And there's pricing programs, there's managed charging programs, there's uh, programs where they'll text you when there's going to be one of these constraint periods, so you can stop charging your car. So just, I want to encourage everybody, once you get an electric vehicle, make sure to tell your utility right away, because if you're going to upgrade your electrical system, they can help you think through that. So just remember that they're trying to be part of the solution here. I'm going to go through very quickly um, because it's highly relevant to all the things that kind of are new in the industry and will take you um, kind of take you through what, what mainstream customers want. And Nate, can you tell me what my hard stop time is? Three minutes? Oh, go. So first of all is relative advantage. So. Nice song. So, so when we went for it, so what is what are some of our major major disruptions that we've seen in our lifetime? So one was kind of the new technology was the internet, right? Just massive massive change. We used to we didn't get movies, right? We had to go get the movies. We had to go to the Sears Robux catalog. Everything we do, we can you know buy flights, everything on the internet. That was massive. Air conditioning. You know, we lived before air conditioning, and it's transformational, especially for cities in the south, right? And then when there was horse and buggy, and we went to regular vehicle, gas vehicle, that was a huge transformation. Going to an electric vehicle isn't that big. It's kind of like going from a cell phone to a smartphone, in some sense. So it's going to be really interesting to see who. Who turns the corner and really wants the EVs? Charging is a big deal. So we found out through research that 70% of the population doesn't know that you can charge an electric vehicle with that type of plug. Well, that means we're failing education. This is all I use with my electric car, is this plug. Can I try it? You should ask someone who owns an electric vehicle to borrow it. For like four days so you can learn how, how it is to charge and maybe it fits your lifestyle and maybe it doesn't. It's hard to do that unless you know someone with a vehicle. Does it fit your lifestyle? Is there a model that's going to fit? Is it affordable to you? And ultimately, 
you know, observability is important because if you think that others are succeeding with electric vehicles, you'll be more apt to do it, which goes all the way back to our social norms way back uh, like 20 minutes ago. So this is our uh, license plate for electric vehicles in Colorado so that people can actually observe because it's really hard to know which, which cars are electric and which ones are not. So I'm going to run past these. I thought I might have time, but this is basically showing you that there are people who are early adopters with electric vehicles in Colorado, and then there's a whole bunch of people that probably won't adopt until 2029, 2030, or later even. So that is, again, fine. So we've got the early adopters that are looking for motivation, prestige, and the environment. Barriers are home charging, and a vision of that lifestyle shift. And again, majority adopters are going to want, they're going to desire to have a value proposition that doesn't exist yet today, but it is coming. Prices are coming down. And I'm paying a third per mile, essentially, for fuel than I was. So it's about the equivalent of a dollar a gallon driving an electric vehicle, which is, which is huge. All right, I got to figure out which videos to watch. Nate, can I show the two, uh, um, the two uh, Old Spice ones? Are those good? And I'm not going to show you this one, but this is fun, too. You can find that one. All right, here we go. This is Hello, Nate. How are you? Fantastic. Does your man look like me? No. Can he smell like me? Yes. Should he use Old Spice body wash? I don't know. Do you like the smell of adventure? Do you want a man who smells like he can bake you a gourmet cake in the dream kitchen he built for you with his own hands? Of course he can. Swan dive into the best night of your life. So ladies, should your man smell like an Old Spice man? You tell me. Now, now I like this commercial so much that I overdubbed it to be relevant to people who had a, had a meeting such as this. So. Hello, ladies. How are you? Ben. Hello, ladies. How are you? Fantastic. Does your man look like me? No. Can he save energy like me? Yes. Should he buy Energy Star appliances? Of course. Do you like clean hydropower? Do you want a man who can bake you a gourmet cake in the super insulated home he built for you with his own hands? Of course you do. Swan dive into the solar heated hot tub. So, ladies, should your man be an energy conservation man? My pants are wet. <laughs> All right, and that is the end of my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Oh, sorry about that. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Uh, we just got a couple of minutes. We've got to make a little uh, set change here. Uh, and I will just put out there, uh, we do have an EV at Paris Pepin. If any of you would like to ever borrow it, take it for a ride, uh, gay shopping is around here, or you can just call the office right there, and uh, you're more than welcome to take it home for a night and uh, test drive it. So I'll, I'll leave that with you, and uh, we'll be back here in just a couple minutes. Fine. This hurts my feet. This hurts my feet, but I need to be able to. I'm actually going to squeeze in right here for just 30 seconds. Well, Oh, Nate, purposely did that. Oh.
I would tell everybody to go back and have another dessert, but it looks like they took them all away. They were pretty good. I think we should give a hand to D. Rasmussen as he's still here. Yeah, Paul, uh, the meeting of Bruce Pepper and Cooperative Services annual meeting is in order. Um, I got to tell you, we were having a holiday party in January, and Nate was up in front introducing the program. And apparently, his seven-year-old son Jackson kind of gave my calendar a book of dad jokes. Anybody know what they are? I mean, they're really they're really bad. I mean, I can tell you, you know. Um, what did one wall say to the other? I'll meet you at the corner. Well, anyway, he's telling his dad jokes. And I've got my phone in my pocket. And I kid you not, two weeks later, out of nowhere, I start getting all these dad jokes on my phone. I don't know where they came from. So apparently, when you're not looking, your phone is listening. So, so be careful. Tonight, um, we will begin with an invocation, and that will be given by Ann Young. Ann. Welcome to your cooperative's 86th annual meeting. It's a privilege to serve on the board as a director and to join you here tonight. As we start this meeting, please close your eyes for a moment of reflection and thanksgiving. <clears throat> Heavenly Creator, as we begin this annual meeting, we pray for a successful and productive meeting. We thank you for those who prepared the meal for us tonight. And we thank you for all the hardworking men and women in this auditorium that are focused on helping people in America and the world work better every day. <clears throat> we are blessed to be part of a cooperative that gives each member a voice and is dedicated to its members, focusing on providing reliable electricity, broadband, and other services that we count on every day. As we celebrate our blessings, let us pray for those in need, those who do not have warm homes, adequate food, those who are struggling with challenge and loss. Bless all of us gathered here tonight as we prepare for the business of this cooperative and share this time together. When our meeting is finished, see us all safely to our homes and our families. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ann. Uh, tonight, we're pleased to have with us, with us the Ellsworth High School Vocal Jazz Group, and they will do the national anthem for us. And then if you would please stay standing after that, Jay Nessa will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance.
direct your attention to the flag and the tree and the wall. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I know you probably heard Bill talk about when was it supposed to snow, whether it was going to be tonight or tomorrow. And I don't know about all of you, I'm kind of sick of winter. In fact, I don't care if it snows a foot tomorrow, I am not going to plow any more snow. <laughs> the sun is going to have to take it away. Um, I will appoint Lori Anderley, our administrative assistant, as reporting secretary. And Dr. James Graham is our parliamentarian. Do we have a number for the quorum? We have 63 in that constitutes a quorum. Um, in your packet that you got tonight, there were uh, special rules of the annual meeting, unless someone would has exception to those, we will uh, they will be approved as handed out. Likewise, with the agenda, if no one has any objections to the agenda, that will also be approved as handed out. Um, you have voting cards in your packet, so uh, is there action to dispense with the reading and notice of meeting proof of mailing? So you can raise your voting card. Got one there. Is there a second? All in favor, raise your voting cards. Against? Very, thank you very much. Likewise, the minutes were handed out in your program. Um, if there are no objections, they will also be approved as mail. We do have a couple of guests with us tonight from, uh, from way down in Madison, Wisconsin, and he was over there, but I don't see where he is now. Rob Richard from the Wisconsin Electric Cooperative Association, and he is director of government relations, or in common words, known as a lobbyist. <laughs> and also from St. Clair Electric, we have Mark Johnson and Amy Weber. There they are right there. Thank you for coming. Okay, at this point in time, we will introduce directors and ballot clerks. And Lori, do you have that list over to you? Or I will have to do it from memory. Got the board members down, but not the ballot clerks. Well, we're going to have to wing it. We'll get the ballot clerks for you. Uh, board members, see if I can do this in order. District 1, Jerry Dreyer. District 2, Ed Haas. District 3, Brian Burke. District 4, Joe Bacon. District 5, and Young. District 6, Jimmy Buker. District 7, myself. District 8, Dan Rice. And District 9, Brian Bursing. And we'll get the names of ballot clerks. I see Harry over there. And Wanda Kinneman and Cindy Kern, I knew, I knew that. Thank you, thank you so much. Brian Bursing will take over right now and he will handle the election of directors, right? Good evening. I'm Brian Burson, District 8 Director and the Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors. At this time, I would like to present each of the director candidates for District 4, 5, and 6. They will have an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. We'll start off with District 4, which includes the towns of El Paso, Spring Lake, Union, Salem, and Rock Elm in Pierce County. We'll have Kay Cashew. My name is Kay, 
And um, my husband, Phil, and I recently bought a farm on 400th Street, just between um, 10, Highway 10 and Greenland Valley. There's another structure now between Greenland Valley and 10, but we live here. So. <laughs> anyway, um, we, we bought an old farm, and we've renovated it, and um, it was in pretty bad repair, and we've really brought new life to it, and most of the neighbors and uh, um, family members, like the people who used to own that farm, are really pleased with everything we've done. Um, so I love living here. My husband and I both love living here. We, I'm an avid gardener. I swim at the Ophir pool several times a week. I recently volunteered for the, as a volunteer for the public library. And this is another thing I thought I'd like to do because throughout my life, I have been really interested in environmental issues. And um, there's really nothing more pressing than how we're going to power the world going forward. And I look forward to learning how um, I can make that happen. I look forward to working with other board members. And um, there's two other people running for District 4. And when I read what they have to say, it sounds wonderful. It's the only thing I believe in as well. So it's going to be um, up to um, the people here on who gets um, elected for that position. Um, I have been on the board of directors for um, the American Massage Therapy Association in Wisconsin chapter. I was on the board of directors there for 18 years and served the needs of our members, the, at that point, 1,800 massage therapists in the state of Wisconsin. I worked with the state um, Senate to help pass legislation that made massage therapy a natural health care profession in the state of Wisconsin. I was one of the main people in making that happen. Um, I'm a hard worker. I get along well with people. Um, I'm very reliable to come to meetings, and I will be here to serve uh, the needs of the members. So I will, if I get elected to this position, I will be open to hearing from any of you. Thank you. Also from District 4, John Parks. Hello, friends and neighbors and fellow co-op members. I'm John Parks. I'm here today to ask for your support as board member for District 4. I live just outside downtown in El Paso. We bought our house back in 2009. A lot of people might have bulldozed it, but after four years of hard work, we were able to call it home. Now, having been a member of the co-op for 14 years and being mostly retired, I'm excited about giving back to the community and to the co-op. If you read my bio, you know that I have experience as a home builder, an energy auditor, a manager of an energy conservation program, and lastly, the director of the View County Habitat for Humanity in Red Deer. So I'm interested in this position because I'm well versed in how we can conserve energy, but there's a lot more to learn for me about our power grid and how electricity is bought and sold. What kind of steps can be taken to ensure that we have a safe, reliable, resilient, and affordable electric grid. I followed what is happening in other states, like California and Texas, where they seem unprepared to deal with adversity. Well, we know about adversity here in Wisconsin, and the snow and ice we experienced last year uh, has put our alignment to the test. But I also know that there is much more to learn, because, friends, the one thing we can count on is change. It's inevitable. The best thing we can do is plan for it. But Bill's speech was really right in my backyard. So in the early 90s, who knew about the impact of the worldwide web? What did we need that for? I had an expensive typewriter back then. It was called a computer. And now we walk around with these amazing mobile computers called cell phones. So what changes are coming for us? Well, no one knows for sure, but we can see some signs. Electric vehicles are here. It may take a decade before most people own one. I think soon. Our grid must be able to handle that, and I think the co-op will be ready. 
There's a lot of data now showing that renewable energy is the most economical way to produce electricity. There are varying opinions about this, along with the pros and cons of renewables. I want to have positive discussions about these issues. I have experience working with a diverse group of people with differing opinions and common goals that keep us forging ahead and achieve the things we care about the most. The co-op is a great place to practice collaboration, and I want to be part of that. This is a great opportunity for me to gain knowledge and be part of making the co-op better. We must be good stewards of this planet, our home. Our choices need to be pragmatic with the goals of safe, reliable, and affordable electricity in the forefront. I'm an optimist. We can do both. If you agree, then I hope you can support me and I will work for a future that leaves a legacy for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you for your time and for listening. Also from District 4, Ann Simons. everybody and thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. My name is Annie Simons. I am the new kid on the block. My husband and I moved here a year ago in December. We chose Wisconsin for many reasons. It's natural beauty, the four seasons, but the real selling point was its people. When we were looking at houses, I took the opportunity to knock on neighbors' doors. I was a little wary at first, given all the no trespassing signs I saw. <laughs> welcomed and asked to come in out of the cold. That's what sold me on it. And it's called Midwest Nice. It's a real thing. And it feels like home to me. I was born and raised in Nebraska. I'm a farm girl at heart. I'm happiest watching the sunset over a field of corn. We bought our property. It's just up by Weezer on Highway 10. And uh, a large part of why we bought that property was because it already came with a number of renewable energies. It has solar and wind and geothermal. And that's an important part for me and my husband. Um, not just for the community, but for the world at large. Um, growing up on a farm, I've seen firsthand the importance that co-ops play in a rural community. Having reliable and affordable electricity has a direct impact on our livelihoods. Historically, co-ops have helped lay the groundwork for innovative solutions, making services accessible to rural areas. I'd like to see that innovation continue as our community grows and evolves. So what can you expect from me? A fresh perspective. I am the new kid on the block. Um, I also offer you my full commitment. I'll dedicate the time and effort it takes to make well-informed decisions, to be knowledgeable of what's happening in the electrical industry, and to be aware of our community's needs. With a degree in international business and a background in business operations, I'll get up to speed quickly. I have experience coordinating, preparing for, and attending corporate board meetings. I enjoy working on teams and having open-minded uh, discussions working together to achieve excellence. I decided to run for a position on the board of directors because I believe in giving back to the community that helps to take care of me. Electricity is a utility that touches all of our lives and I don't want to take that for granted. I would be honored to serve in a role that can make an impact on the future of this community. Thank you. From District 5, it's Howard Ellsworth with Pierce County and me. tonight as your District 5 Director nominee. It's been my honor to be your Director since 2019, and I thank you for that. During these past four years, I've had the opportunity to re represent you at our co-ops board meetings and at various regional and national electric cooperative events. Throughout this time, I've developed an even deeper appreciation for the products and services the electric co-ops provide to you, its member owners. In many cases, rural America is undervalued and underserved. But I can tell you that the management and the board work hard every day to make sure this is not the case for the members of Pierce and Pepperdine counties. I know that the hardworking team continually focuses on you 
our members and what will improve your lives now and into the future. Along with my fellow board members at Pierce Kirkland, we have reviewed and analyzed and approved a number of business initiatives during my time on the board, such as an investment in broadband, electric vehicle charging, and renewable energy. We are always focused on initiatives that provide affordable and reliable services that contribute to your ability to live better. The formation and launch of Swift Current Connect in 2021 has been a game changer in my life, and I hope in your lives as well, if you're lucky enough to have it yet. Many days I work from home, and I don't have to drive the 35 miles each way to work or wait 15 minutes for a file to upload to my company's system. We now have broadband speeds that rival those of the metro area, and that's a great thing for us. I also have been fortunate to be a volunteer financial consultant for USAID, the United States Agency for International Development. In the fall of 2022, I had the opportunity to re return to the country of Moldova as for a financial consulting project. If you don't already know, Moldova is a bordering country to Ukraine. As I reflect on my time there, I know how fortunate we are to live in this country with the many opportunities that we have to live a great life today and tomorrow and hopefully for many generations to come. I am committed and confident in my ability to continue to serve as your director and I promise to work hard every day for you. I strongly believe that the future, our co in the future our co-op co will be even more successful providing the essential products and services that contribute to every member's ability to live better. I thank you for your vote and for the opportunity to serve you for another three years. Thank you. And for District 6 in the town of Trimbelli, Pierce County, which you said I had to say something nice about her just because she's running president. It's again, it's Jane Hunter. First of all, it is so nice to see so many familiar faces, including that of my almost 95-year-old mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> this is the last time that I'm going to be asking her to vote. For the past nine years, it has been an honor and a pleasure to represent membership and District 6, the beautiful Trimbell area. Many changes have occurred at the co-op during my tenure. Most notable, we brought our outstanding CEO on board, Mr. Nate Fetcher, to revitalize our co-op model. And with his leadership, we were able to bring broadband, a critical necessity today, to our membership. I am sure my last three years with Pierce Pepin will be exciting and challenging. You have my pledge. Our goal is to help you live better. It's been really fun. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I now turn the floor back to you. Okay, the polls will be open. Those of you that haven't voted and are going to vote in person, you can do so at this time. Yeah, I guess I came up. 
I heard I heard an inhibitor or something. I heard a tip uh, inhibitor. Yeah, two oh. seconds. We what? found it. Taking two seconds. <laughs> Should have been on the chair. <laughs> yeah. You can leave it right there. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've gotten the mics all. I got them pretty close. As long as people remember to stay ahead of the speaker. Yeah. Make them come out. You think paper airplanes got them? Huh? You think paper airplanes got them? Yeah. So why can't they even use them? Has everyone had a chance to vote that wishes to? Are there any more votes to be cast? Seeing none, I will declare the polls closed. We do have a bylaw change this year, Ms. Huber, and our uh, and Ginny Huber will be handling that for the group. Ginny. Thank you, Chairman. As part of an ongoing review and a continuing effort to best position the Pierce Pepin Cooperative Services to meet the members' needs today and into the future, the Board of Directors and Management recommend the following changes to the restated bylaws. No modifications to Pierce Pepin Cooperative Services Articles of incorporation will be made. These proposed changes are the culmination of the article and bylaw review conducted by the Board of Directors and the Cooperatives of Turing. A full text of the proposed changes was mailed to each member as part of the annual meeting materials approximately 30 days prior to this annual meeting in compliance with our present bylaws. One proposed amendment will be presented and voted on. Chairman Webb, unless there is a request to read the proposed amendment in its entirety, I will provide a brief summary of the proposed change. <laughs> you guys never. <laughs> okay. no. All right, here's the amendment, much shorter. <coughs> Update Article 7, Revenue and Receipts, Section 9, Assignment to Federated Youth Foundation Incorporated. This change would allow the members who choose to donate all or any part of their capital credits to either Federated Youth Foundation Incorporated to be used <coughs> for educational purposes or to the Pierce Pepin Cares Foundation to which the Pierce Pepin Cares Board of Directors determines donations from grant requests received. By direction of the Board of Directors, I move to amend Article 7, Section 9 of the Restated Bylaws Meeting of Members by making the following changes. The title would change to Assignment to an Eligible Charity and insert the following. Or Pierce Pepin Cares Foundation, a charitable tax exempt organization. A correction to charitable, a correction to tax exempt punctuation when referring to Federated Youth Foundation would also be made. All right. It is moved to amend Article 7, Section 9, with the changes that were provided, this does not need a second. Is there any debate? 
Seeing none, would all those in favor please raise your cards and would you keep them up because we have to get a count. So if you bear with us, we got our, our full fingered people back there and want to get this problem count. Guys, got it. Okay, are there any? You can put them down. Are there any opposed? One opposed. Okay, and we will get the count from you after the meeting. Thank you very much, Jim. You're welcome. We have with our tonight, with us tonight for the financial report, our auditor, Abby Williamson from. Carlson S.B. Abby? supply chain issues. I can talk really loud if you like. My name is Dan Williamson. I'm with Pierce County, of course. 
Um, I know that due to supply chain issues, some of the heavy equipment that's used to support the grid, I know that the club's been buying a lot of things ahead of time so that we don't run out of the stuff we need to fix the lines. Mm -hmm. was, what category was that up there? Oh, that would be on the um, balance sheet, and that would be the property plant and equipment total. And will that continue? Will we continue buying ahead like that? It's just that's how it's going to be? Yeah, and I wouldn't necessarily say you're um, spending money ahead of time. You're just committing to make those purchases in future years. So by the year that you're um, slotted to make that replacement, you have that payment available, and that's when the expenditure is really That's all I wanted to know. Great. Thanks, Abby. Yeah, just to piggyback on that a little bit. For example, two years ago we ordered a, a digger dairy truck, and we thought we were really getting out in front of it. It was supposed to be here last year. We saw it in the shop last month. I mean, things are. There are some things like that that are in incredibly far out. Um, I would say on our electric supplies, we've been really proactive on a lot of stuff. And of course, you sure don't want to get caught with all transformers or wires or stuff. But it's a definite, it's a definite issue. That is for sure. With a lot of other industries. Thanks for that question. Uh, thanks for choosing to spend your evening with us. We hope you found it so far enjoyable and, and kind of engaging. You know, I was telling you about about Nate and his dad jokes, and this one kind of hit awful close to home. I thought, I thought the dryer was shrinking my clothes, and it turns out it was the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my wife did. She did. Um, after my presentation, Nate will be up here. If you got any questions at all, we'll take them at that time. Again, this year's been it's been quite a year. We've got COVID mostly behind us, and we've been operating at warp speed again. Even though the fiber to the home, high-speed internet is still kind of the new and fun, pro fun project, we still remain dedicated to our core business that started in 1939, which was providing safe, reliable, affordable electric service. After hearing comments from Bruce with current customers, I've got a glimpse of how our founders must have felt when they turned the lights on to the first customer. It proved to be life-changing, as is our high-speed internet to many. It truly embodies our tagline, helping you live better. And that's just more than words on the bill that you get or your letterhead. Every decision that your board makes is based on, will this help our members live better? On a more serious note, I'd like to address a couple of issues which I feel, feel the need to set the record straight, and it's kind of, it's bugged me a little bit. In the last couple of years, I've heard comments in the community that Bruce Kevin quit home security and quit appliances and propane. And how do we know the same thing won't happen with Swift Current? So let me address these on a case-by-case -case basis. Home security was something we tried 25 years ago. Didn't work. Uh, other companies picked up our customers. There was a little risk. A lot of reasons it didn't work. And it was 25 years ago. Done deal. OK, appliances. We were in the appliance business for 70 years. It started out to build load. And as you saw Bill talk about tonight, uh, helped people improve their lives. After a while, and into the probably early 2000s, our losses started to approach six figures. And it wasn't fair to ask the 93% of the members to subsidize the 7% of the members to purchase from us. And at that time, the internet was starting to become popular. People were shopping online, and frankly, they came to our showroom to look at the appliances and went and bought them somewhere else. Believe me, there's nobody more than me that misses being able to call up and say, my refrigerator quit, can you bring me one tomorrow? I miss that, I really do. But it wasn't, it was an issue of fairness, and things changed. 
propane. At the time we started this vision, it looked like fuel cells might be the up and coming technology in the rural areas they were powered primarily by propane. In a nutshell, that's why we entered the propane business. As we know today, fuel cells still haven't become mainstream. However, we were able to grow the business to nearly 2,500 customers and had a modest margin. With some of our innovation and technology, I think we raised the bar a bit for propane service. So why did, why did we get out into being successful? Number one, Larry Dockestel, who was our CEO at the time, was kind of a propane guru. And as he was nearing retirement, we knew that we probably would not be able to replace a, him with a CEO that had propane and electric experience. So we sought out some other co-ops that we knew were in the propane business. And some of the criteria were, number one, they needed to take care of our current employees with wages, benefits, and jobs. We did find a buyer, but because we still have a non-disclosure agreement, I can't say how much we sold it for, but you know, as the good old boys say, we did okay. That's kind of the long, that's the long and short of it. The addition of Swift Current Connect parallels the introduction of electricity providing service where no one else wants to do it. For those who are concerned that the electric Vision will subsidize the broadband grid. It won't, period. Let me be clear, this project could not happen without the public money infusion, just as early REA projects would never have happened without low interest loans. I contend that today fast, reliable internet service is as important to many of our members as electricity was in the late 30s and beyond. And this project doesn't happen without our dedicated employees who want to help you live better. Just a few comments about the electric side. Our board and management deal with a lot of issues that will affect our ability to provide safe, reliable, and affordable electric service in the future. There are those that believe we need to move to a carbon-free society in an unrealistically short time period. Renewables are great and they have their place, but we still need baseload generation for times when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And I gotta, I gotta look at something right now. It'll, sh it'll show in the MISO market, which is a Midwest independent sy system operator market, it goes from, from Canada clear down to the Gulf, and it shows what the mix of power is right now at this point in time. Of course, it's getting dark out. Solar is 0.03% right now. Other is 1.95%. Wind is pretty high right now. It's 28.74%. Nuclear is 14.07%. Natural gas is 31.02%. And coal is 24.17%. And this, this changes every second throughout the day. Right now, the Price per megawatt hour on the wholesale market is $19.74 a megawatt, which is it's getting right down there. But it's interesting to see how this changes on cold days, on sunny days, on windy days. Um, <coughs> coal and gas will fluctuate some. Solar and wind fluctuate a lot. Nuclear stays right in there because they, they run flat out most of the time. In my opinion, the only way to be totally carbon free for electricity is nuclear. There's some exciting advancements in small nuclear modular plants, but they're at least 10 years away. So please let your elected officials know that we need an all of the above, all of the above policy for energy. And I hope you stay current with the WEC News Magazine that you received because there's been a lot of really good articles in there every month about what is going on in the energy industry. Again, thank you for coming. If you've got questions tonight, feel free to contact any of us uh, anytime. And if we don't know the answer, we'll find it for you, hopefully. 
But next on our agenda is our present CEO, Nate Betcher. And Nate's a pretty smart guy. You know, we, we hired him because we knew he was smart, but we really didn't know how smart he was until we found out he was when, he lived in St. Louis before he got here. And so one day he walked in the bank wanting to see his loan officer, and the man says, what, what do you want to see me about? Well, Nate said, I'm, I'm going to Europe on business for two weeks, and I need to borrow $5,000. So the loan officer says, well, we'll need some kind of collateral. You know, loan officers kind of like that. Well, he says, I've got this new car. It's all paid for. Uh, here's the title. Here's the papers. Here's everything. So everything checks out. The employee takes the car, parks it off in a secure place underneath the bank, and away they go. So two weeks later, Nate comes back and repays the $5,000 plus interest, which is $15.41. So the loan officer said, we're really happy to have your business and this worked out really good, but we're, we're a little puzzled. Um, while you're away, we, we kind of checked you out and found out that, you know, you're pretty well off. You got a, got a pretty nice house in St. Louis with pretty good equity and you got no debt, and we're curious why you want to borrow five thousand dollars. And he said, "Where else in St. Louis can I park my car for two weeks for fifteen dollars?" News to me. If you can't tell, uh, Roger and I uh, share a healthy appreciation for your dad, Joe. Too. I think he's a little jealous of, of my calendar, and i got to remember this year to uh, make sure I purchase uh, one for him. And and really, the punchline, I could have made that story a lot shorter for you about knowing that I was smart, and that's the first time you met my wife, because she's definitely the, the brains of our, our family. And uh, I only bring that up uh, because there's a good chance that she may be watching us on her YouTube screen. So <laughs> I need to make sure I, I get that in there. Um, uh, many of you probably noticed uh, uh, Aaron from our, from our IT group here uh, video streaming this and putting it out on, on YouTube. And, and uh, it's just another great use of technology that allows people that uh, aren't here in person or cannot be here in person to still be able to be part of the co-op and part of the experience. So I really want to talk to you about uh, three things today, three things that are on the screen. The strength of the cooperative, embracing our future, and providing uh, connected solutions. And I look at this picture a lot, and uh, maybe some of you uh, know these individuals, but these were the original founders of the Electric Co-op. And uh, this uh, statement here below, you can, you can read it, I won't read it for you, but uh, it talks about just kind of the struggle it was back in the 30s to get electricity to rural uh, western Wisconsin, Pierce County, Pepin, St. Croix, and, and even Buffalo counties. And I look at this picture because it often, uh, I, I try to think about what, what that must have been like uh, some 80, some years ago, and, and just, you know, the, the, the tough times and, and, and all the, the hard work. And I think about a lot of the work that we're doing today to bring fiber to all of our rural residents. And I think about a lot of the hard work that, that goes into all of that. I'm very fortunate because we have a strong group of pillars that help us do the things that we're doing. And first of all, that foundation is our community, which all of you are a part of. And I'm very thankful for the community support that we've had to go out and to build fiber and to continue serving our members to help them live better. I think about our directors, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about them here in a minute, but ultimately, they're the ones that help make this decision to move forward. And I don't think that would have happened at every electric co-op in Wisconsin. I don't think it would happen at every electric co-op in the nation. You have to have a group of directors that are forward-thinking. You have to have a, a group of directors that are willing to take a little bit of risk. And I think this group of directors has done a great job of thinking through whether or not this was the right move for us to make. And I'm so proud to get to work with them each and every day uh, to make sure that, that we continue our mission. I also want to thank all of our employees. And if I could just get all of our employees to kind of stand up for a quick minute uh, across the room here, you'll see them in, in all kind of parts. And uh, really just give them a round of applause. Thank you. that we exist as an electric cooperative and 
provide my search for that origin is because of all of you. That's the only reason. It's the reason we show up every day is to come serve you. And we'll never forget that. We'll always think about how we're going to serve our members. Talk about our cooperative strength. And we hear a lot about how our rates aren't competitive. We did a little analysis here this past winter. And we hear a lot about this company called Excel. Maybe you've heard of them. And there's sort of this notion that goes around from time to time that, you know, Excel is doing so many things better than us. Well, I would submit to you that on average, our electric bills for most of our residential customers is actually cheaper than Excel's rates today. Let me just say that once again. On average, our residential rates are cheaper than Excel today. So I think we're doing something right. So as you're out talking to our community members and you hear them talk about how great Excel is and how they're doing all these things better than Pierce Pepin, I want you to look at this because at the end of the day, this is what really matters to a lot of you, right? Is to have reliable, affordable power. And I think we're doing something pretty special here that's helping us control our rates and to make sure that we continue to serve that mission. I talk about our employees. They're a strong and capable group of individuals. I say they're the most talented group of people that we've had since I've been here in Pierce Pepin. And I don't say that lightly, because I've worked with a lot of talented people over the course of my career. But I'm so excited about the group of people that we have working here each and every single day. They come to work, they're passionate, they want to serve you, they want to help you. We sit in meetings and we talk about what are the things that we can do to, to make our members' lives better. And they have great ideas. And we talk about as a senior management team, the best thing that we can do is get the heck out of their way and let them be empowered to do the job that we've hired them to do. And they've done a great job on that. And I'm so excited to see all the things that they're going to do here over the next few years. I talked about our directors. And I want you to take a look at this because I truly believe this. Our directors don't just show up just to get the... The, the cheese curds and the, you know, the, the beef sticks and the, and the water and pop that's in the refrigerator, right? They, they show up every meeting to work really, really hard to make sure that this co-op, Pierce Pepin Cooperative Services, is a well-run organization. And you should be very, very proud of the individuals that represent you on membership. They do a great job, and I can't be more excited to continue working with I want to talk a little bit about embracing our future. And I'm not going to talk about all of these items, but I'm going to talk about a couple of them. And uh, I, I'm just, you know, really, um, I've said it a million times already, but I'm just excited about the direction that we're going. There are so many really cool technologies out there that are going to really help us transform into a co-op for the future. And one of those is the announcement of our first solar array that will help power Pierce Pepin members. So this solar array is gonna be down on Highway 35, the intersection of County Road K and Highway 35. We worked with the Trutman family to secure land from them. One Energy is going to be our partner in this. They're gonna be the ones that actually goes out and builds the array. They're gonna be the ones that manage the array. And at least in this situation, we're actually gonna buy the power from them. And that's going to be a great thing for us. Uh, about 4.2 million kilowatt hours, powering 525 homes. So this is a really great project. You're going to start to see this take shape here uh, over the summer. And uh, hopefully it will be online by the end of the year. And uh, if, if solar doesn't get you excited, then, then hopefully the, the sheep will. Because they use sheep to do grazing underneath the solar panels. And someone asked me, are we allowed to come pet the sheep? And I, I don't know, but we'll find that answer out. And uh, if, if, the, if the farmer lets us do that, well, then we'll, we'll have a, a petting day at the, uh, the solar array. But uh, we're really excited about this. This could be a great thing for, for our membership. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, providing connected solutions. And I just want to be really careful about this. You know, sometimes we, we spend a lot of time talking about broadband and fiber and swift current connect and and it's kind of the, the exciting thing that, that we're spending a lot of time talking about. But first and foremost, we will always be a provider of reliable and affordable electricity. That is the heart of why this co-op exists. 
And we haven't forgotten that mission. We have a great group of linemen that come to work every single day. We pull their boots up. They go out in the inclement weather. And they make sure the lights stay on. And we'll never forget that. And we're going to make sure that we do everything possible to ensure that we have a well-built, strong, resilient electric grid so that as we get weather, as we get storms, as we have issues with the power supply, that we can manage the grid in a way that ensures that the lights stay on. We talk a lot in our office about being transformational. And I love this picture. I stole this picture from someone, and maybe Liz took it or someone, but I, I stole this picture. And this is a group of our employees and our directors and even uh, one of the, the daughters of our employees that showed up on a Saturday at our office to help with Ruby's Pantry. How many of you have participated in Ruby's Pantry? Yeah, quite a few of you. What, what, a great, what a great thing. It's been just phenomenal. And we're so proud to be able to help support that and provide our facility. But it's a lot of work. And it's a lot to get our building ready. It's a lot to have volunteers ready. And yet every month we've had employees who've stepped up to the plate and made sure that we can continue to host Ruby's Pantry. And if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I'd encourage you to do that. And uh, I would also even more so encourage you to help volunteer uh, for it as well. It's, it's a great organization. And uh, I, I think uh, you know, for the morning that you'll spend there, it'll be well worth your time. There's a number of other items that you see there we're doing to help be a part of our community. And again, our goal is to help be transformational. The bedrock of Pierce Pep and Cooperative Services is our community, and we're there to help support and serve and make our community a better place. And uh, it's our employees and our directors and all of you are members that are going to help us be a transformational agent. So let's talk a little bit about where we're at with Swift Current. Uh, over the last 18 months, so we broke ground in September of uh, 2021, over 18 months we've built 600 miles of fiber. It's amazing. When we complete our uh, phase two, we'll pass by 4,500 homes. We're getting really close to having that wrapped up. We have today 1,200 active subscribers. We started with subscriber number one on January 31st, 2022. And so just in a little over a year, we've connected 1,200 customers. And we have a backlog. We have a backlog of about 800 customers, probably some of you in this room, that can't wait to get the service. And trust me, uh, we can't wait to get the service to you either. And we're every day pushing our contractors to get things done so that we can get you all connected. We're really excited about that. And we're really excited about the fact that we've received so much public support, public funding to help make this happen. $15 million that has poured into this project that is going to be used to build out this broadband network. And as Roger said, we couldn't do that without, without that money. So where are we going? Uh, by the end of this year, we'll build another 200 miles of fiber. We'll pass by 6,000 homes in total. And we expect by the end of the year to have 3,000 customers connected. That's our goal, is to have 3,000 homes connected with our fiber. We want to be the number one trusted provider of community on home broadband. And as Roger and Abby pointed out, this year, at the end of this year, will contribute $2.5 million of revenue and put $800,000 that the cooperative has made is going to continue to pay dividends over the years in terms of helping to pay for the cost of that and helping to increase uh, our ability to have connected homes in this area. And frankly, that's what it's all about. People want to have a connected home. They want to have reliable electricity. And they want to have a great broadband connection. And I think someone made the comment that we are, you know, sort of, we're, we're getting to a comparable speed or a comparable service that they have in the metro area. And I'm going to make an argument. We have a better service than they have in the metro area. We can deliver one gig of service upload and download to the home and have very, very low latency. And that's really just uh, something that you just don't actually see that often in the metro area. So we're doing better. I, and I, I understand the sentiment of comparing us to the, to the big city, but we're actually doing better. And that's a good thing for us. So this statement, I think, is something that all of our employees uh, try to live by. We provide solutions that our members and customers can be connected 
with electricity and broadband to help them live better. And that's what we show up every, do, every day to do, is to help all of you live better. My grandpa had a saying. My grandpa used to say, leave it better than you found it. And that's what we're here to do as the management and employees of Pierce Pepin Cooperative. You've entrusted us the cooperative, and our goal is to help make it better. And hopefully when we've all moved on, you'll see that our cooperative is better today than it was when we found it. So with that, thank you, and we'll take questions. Thanks, Nate. Do we have questions? You said that solar farm is a third five and five four. Correct, that's correct. And just, uh, we have some microphones going around, Just and, and the only reason I know some of you can hear, but it also helps people online. So the question was, uh, where is the array? It's going to be uh, Highway 35 at the corner of County Road K, where it comes down in there, kind of in the, I guess, the north, uh, northwest corner of that. Right. Between Simon and Lawson, there's some rock that looks Yeah, so the question is, what, what's the percentage of the money that's coming from the state versus the federal government? So it's kind of a loaded question that you ask because a lot of the state money is actually federal money that was passed down to the state to, to push out. So um, the money that we've received thus far is about, there's about $800,000 of the state money. And then the, the bulk of that other money is actually uh, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act money that's come either through the local towns, uh, county, or uh, through the state program, which again was funneled through uh, the federal government uh, through their local program. Question? Yeah, Mike. Try this again. Uh, so far, Correct me if I'm wrong in this, but your broadband has gone into where the population is better, thicker, and let's say when you get into the southeastern corner or into Trumpelo or Trumpelo County. So do you expect your dynamics to stay the same when you get out to where a lot more miles, fewer homes? Yes, great question. So um you're, you're right that our, our density happens to be around Ellsworth, River Falls, and that area. And as we get further out, and, and really the area that, that gets further out is really Pepin County. Um, we get down to densities that are that are in the, the four homes um, per mile. And so, yeah, that absolutely changes the dynamic. And, and we've tried to help educate the, the Public Service Commission on that as well. Um, all the companies that are, are building broadband today are looking for areas where there's there's density. And now we're getting to some of those areas where, where the density isn't so great. And to help them understand that as you get further and further out, the cost to serve those customers is greater. And so that's why when we apply for grants and we go through that process, we try to help them understand um, that, you know, that, that we need more money. We need more support to build to those areas. So what changes about that for us is it actually probably allow, is gonna force us to scale back just a little bit to get to some of those areas until more funding becomes available. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, this last grant round, there was something like 30 or $40 million in total. The previous grant round, there was over $100 million. So we can't go out and look at a project like we did before and ask for a $10 million of, of, of the money that they had so we had to pare that back a little bit and ask for a much smaller, smaller area. But when we look at it, we still look at the same metrics of we have to be able to provide, you know, 40 to 50 percent of that has to come through public funding for us to be able to even do that. So I don't know if that helped answer your question or not, but that, that's how we approach it. Hey, Barry. at the federal level, or is that just, how does that come about? 
Okay, on the expense dollar on your uh, finance sheet here, you've got uh, the dollar all does stuff here, and you got a margin of six percent. Is that margin mandated at the federal level, or how do you arrive at that figure, and what is it destined? And, and you're talking about the co-op as a whole, electric broadband. Well, the expense dollar on this on this sheet here, I'm wondering. Uh, no, just the co-op operation. You got six percent margin. I know you have a margin that is mandated at the federal level because you can't operate in the book in the red. It, it, yeah, just just to make sure that that we're all on the same page. We don't have any federal mandate about relative to a margin percentage. Our borrowing that we do is through uh, Cooperative Finance Corporation, which is a which is a cooperative. So there are certain financial metrics that we need to hit to make sure that we have our debt service covered, as well as to make sure that uh, we keep our, our equity levels where they're at. So uh, we're not targeting a 6% or a 7% margin. Uh, the board evaluates this, and Roger, you know, weigh in here. Um, we, we evaluate every year. But, but our, our view on it is, a, is sort of a long-term view on our financial metrics, not just a single, you know, single margin percentage um, that maybe you might see in a, a more for-profit world. But who would come into the picture if, if that if that margin falls into the minus side? Somebody, either your finance people or somebody is going to say, "Hey, hold on, we got to do something." Well, yeah, you, you, I. I'll let you answer first. But well, I, I can tell you who will come into the picture, and that's all of you out here. <laughs> because what? Okay, we sit down, we set a budget in November. We've got to pay all the bills. Obviously, our, our biggest cost is wholesale power. Our second biggest cost is labor. Um, when it gets down to controllable costs, we really don't have that many. But we sat down to come up with a budget that provides a margin that allows us to make capital improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Now, for the wild card, when you set a budget and you set it on a kilowatt sale, this is weather. And that's the wild card. And sometimes we're really good at hitting our targeted amount, sometimes not so much. But we basically look, what is a reasonable margin that we need to continue operations, and of course, we return all our margin over a period of years. So there's not any magic number, just the fact that it said was 6% this year, it might be 7 next year it might be 4 But if we get to a situation where our income does not match our expenses, that's when rates go up. We've been really fortunate that we haven't had to do that for quite a few years for a lot of reasons. Most of it because we get a lot of smart people working for us. But that's that's how that happens. Does that, that answer your question, Barry? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes. Hi, I, I want to applaud the, um, the expansion to using a solar farm. Um, and I was just, that made me think about, do you have any plans for the future? Are there any discussions about um, battery backups to uh, capture and, and use that? Energy when the sun doesn't shine? Yeah, great question. The short answer to that is yes. Um, there, there's kind of two approaches to that. One is more of a, we call it a grid scale uh, level battery, which you know, is going to be obviously a much bigger, bigger battery. We're talking one megawatt, two megawatt, five megawatt type battery. And then there's also the residential uh, side of that. Uh, we are looking at doing a pilot this year with a residential battery, more so, so we can just understand the technology a little bit more, um, get ourselves and our, our, our people more comfortable with, with what that looks like. Uh, I think we have one or two, Dave will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, members today that are that have a battery backed up on their, on their system today. Um, so the short answer to that is yes. Um, the long the long term, the, the larger scale batteries aren't yet quite cost effective uh, for us to invest in that, but. As prices come down with that, we'll continue to look at mechanisms like that. Okay, more questions? Yeah, right there. Uh, yeah, 
And so Glenn Fisher, District 3. Um, the more of a, uh, it's kind of a suggestion around just the balance sheet and thinking of swift current, a lot of investment, a lot of good construction, a lot of asset now showing up this year are, are related to. I, I think it'd be helpful to see a non-consolidated budget too, or a breakout specific of swift current. Um, I know it's a long-term investment anticipated that, uh, and I trust that there is going to be a breaking point where it will be uh, recoup all, all of its costs and be a cash flow positive scenario that's down the road a ways. Uh, I know I've heard statements that, uh, strong statements that we don't want to subsidize the electric revenue and electric service to an internet service. I think that's an important priority for a lot of members. I've heard um, board members state that. I've heard that statement at the start. In some communications I've read, I feel some of your messages are preparing for a point where the electric operations are going to have to subsidize those bills and years. Um, I, I think, yeah, a consolidated budget sheet breaking those out would be helpful for us all. There's one, well, I'm going to have to back up a little bit. Um, the part about, I think you saw the figures on here about electric subsidizing broadband, but it's not going to happen. There's a reason why it's not broken out on the balance sheet. The reason is, as the electric, the broadband is a subsidiary. The electric co-op owns all the fiber, um, everything but some of the minor electronics. The co-op owns all of it, the co-op holds the debt on all of that. So that's why it's in the co-op balance sheet. Um, the way that the co-op gets paid back from the fiber division is that we, the fiber division pays a set dollar amount every month per customer to the co-op that covers principal and debt. And that can be changed at any time, but that's, you know, it's kind of an in the family type thing, but that's why it's not on the balance sheet and why if we broke it out, it wouldn't mean a whole lot because all you'd see for assets on the broadband side would be some electronics that are in the huts and probably the modems and the houses and such things. Yeah, just put a little more color on the, the functional side of that. Um, so this is a really interesting year. Um, it was forecasted when we started this year that we would have about an 8% power, wholesale power cost increase. Our, bill, our rates are not forecasted to go up. Now, a lot of that is more probably driven by uh, natural gas prices. Um, but when you look at the, the amount of revenue that Swift Current was going to be pushing back into uh, the co-op, the board did not see an immediate need to raise electric rates because in a lot of ways we were covering our debt and, and even uh, providing a little bit more on top of uh, on top of the revenue stream that the co-op could use to help offset some of that debt. So I'm not sure you, you, you commented about the, the messaging is preparing uh, for, for some sort of you know situation where uh, the, the co-op may have to subsidize uh, the retail broadband. I'm not sure where, where that messaging is coming from. I, I wouldn't suggest to you that I, I, I feel that way today. Uh, I don't see that in the next five years. And when you look at our, our projections from a financial perspective um, and, and review where we're at, um, I just, I don't see that happening. Um, any cost increases, and, and I want to be really clear about this, any cost increases to the electric side are going to be driven by wholesale power prices. 8% is what they went up this year. So you look at all of our neighbors, co-ops, they're all looking at raising their rates, and, and we're not having to do that. And I don't think that, that dynamic is probably going to change in the next five years. Energy uh, supply has become a lot more volatile. And uh, we're just we're we're in a situation where um, we need to prepare ourselves for rate increases, but it's going to be because wholesale power rates are increasing, not because of electric. So hopefully that helps. Does that answer your question? Uh, it, it it does give some uh, yeah some comfort. Yeah. Okay, thank you. More questions. One minute.
Um, I just have a question. In regards to the um, bridge that you guys have for your properties that are going to be chargers, obviously not the pilot for the EV chargers, but um, once you have everything in place, it seems like a lot of stuff can be penalized for having the electric car because not not everybody is out there with the money and the output that is really not the same. So I'm just curious if you guys have any ideas. So it's a good question about our, our EV rates. Um, we're, we're right now in the process of evaluating our rate structure as a whole, and I know Dave's in the back there taking notes, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. I, I think you're going to probably see some, some different rate structures uh, across the board and how we look at it, whether it's time of use or demand or other things. So thanks for bringing that up. We'll, we'll, we'll do some follow-up on that to make sure that we're not penalizing you in any way for that. And I don't think we have a lot of people today on our time of use EV rate, so um, just uh, thanks for bringing that up. More questions? Go ahead. Okay. How is the too close? The availability charge that we get every month, how is that established? Yeah, so you're talking about the facility charge that, that you see. So the facility charge is a is a recovery mechanism for, for really our operational costs of running the co-op. The historical model of, of energy sales is that you would take a portion of the kilowatt hour price and apply that to uh, the, the operational costs, right? So pay the salaries, the materials, the upkeep of the system, all of that would be paid out of that, that margin on the kilowatt hour sale. And, and the way the industry is moving is, it's moving further away from a margin on that kilowatt hour sale to that facility charge. So our facility charge, to be, to be very you know, upfront and honest, probably needs to be about $75 to cover those operational costs. Now, before you run out of here and go, Nate said that we're moving to a $75 facility charge, that's not what he said. I'm just telling you that's what the dollar amount would need to be. So what's happening there is that $35 or so, that delta between those two numbers, most residential on average are paying about $45, that $30 is being recouped across energy sales. And so what we actually did a couple of years ago is we looked at this, the higher end uh, users, if you will, the, the, the people that are, are uh, purchasing more kilowatt hours are actually making up a higher percentage of that total mix of going to pay for those operational costs. And so we continue to look at that fixed charge to make sure that there's equity across all of the, the membership. And I think eventually the model will continue to evolve where, where that number will get higher, but the kilowatt hour charge shouldn't have to move uh, incrementally then. We, we should be able to keep that flat or maybe even in the future reduce that a little bit as well. Does that help? We have a lot of discussion about this at our board, and really what, what Nate is talking about is eventually, in a perfect world, the energy, the kilowatt hours, if you can define that, like <laughs> Bill tried to explain to us, would be a pass-through. There'd be no margin on electricity. What you would be paying for is to keep the poles and the wires and the transformers up. The, Kilowatt hours that you use would be just a pass through. That's a perfect world. <laughs> we don't live in a perfect world, but we're trying to get close to it. Any more questions? Yes. Quick one on the solar garden. Um, I think it's a great, great move. You do some good, good economics there. Um, are the subscriptions. So you you have subscription sizes. You'll be, you'll be selling, are they going to be for residential, commercial? How are you going to, or, or is it all going to go to the, the co-op mix? Yeah, with, with this array today, we're, we're probably not going to sell output. Um, we are looking at uh, additional arrays that put up 
which will give us more of that opportunity uh, to sell uh, output on a, on a per panel basis. Uh, the board has actually worked through some of that already and we sort of have a foundation of what that's going to look like. Um, just, just to be very transparent, we're, we're out looking right now for additional land. We're, we're in conversation with some others and, and our goal would be to, to utilize uh, the full capacity of what we're allowed to do on our own. So, so just to be real clear, um, Dairyland Power Cooperative, who we buy our wholesale power uh, from, we only have a small percentage of our total sales that we can go generate on our own. Otherwise, the rest of that has to be purchased from Dairyland. And so that, that capacity or that amount, the, the, the amount of that was just actually increased. Um, so we have probably about another megawatt or so that we can add uh, to another solar array if we want to do that. So we're out looking for land to, to go through that process and, and we'll look to develop that here over the next couple of years. The ARPA money you mentioned, that all came from township. I think that's fine, but you mentioned very fine. Yeah, so, so Dean's point is um, the ARPA funding that we received has come from our towns that have supported broadband. Uh, as well as the state, and then uh, we received funding from uh, St. Croix County and uh, Pepin County. Now, we add them to the list. Uh, we have not received any ARPA funding from Pierce County. There's eight million out there. You haven't said so much. Yeah, so uh, Pierce County has uh, created a committee. Uh, so ask why. Pierce County has created a committee to look at uh, potential uses for, for the ARPA funding. Um, that committee has met once in a while uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, we submitted three and a half million dollars as a, not just for Pierce Pepin, by the way, three and a half million dollars that, that would be used for providers to go out and do this. Um, we were told that that was too much money, that that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't make it past the committee. And so um, we've been sort of uh, waiting to see where that committee goes with some of their decisions relative to the ARPA money. Um, this train is moving fast. So I would love to show you a picture of Pierce County right now and show you how many locations in Pierce County uh, don't already have broadband service, are not scheduled to get within the next you know, six to 12 months, uh, or don't have other projects that have been funded. And, and it's a very small, small percentage of those homes in Pierce County. And so, you know, I, I keep hoping that we'll, we'll get to a place with the county where we can um, participate with them and partner with them to, to get some of those funds, but that hasn't been their inclination uh, at this point uh, to do that. So um, we're, we're, we're hopeful, but, but we're, we're, we're not waiting for that. We've moved forward and, and uh, we realize this was too big of a challenge to, to sit on our hands waiting for, for someone to provide us funds that, that didn't seem willing to do that. Okay, the hour is uh, continuing to march on. We have one last question. I can speak loud enough. <laughs> I have a friend who vacations in Arizona during the winter. And during one of the months, whether it was February or whatever, I don't know if it involved the exchange of the meters, his electric bill went up at double from last year. Has that happened to anybody in here? It actually doubled from what it was last year? If it didn't happen to anybody else, then I don't have a question. Yeah, and I, I would just encourage your friend to call in and talk to our, our staff. I mean, we've got great tools to look at that. Yeah, sometimes things happen. So we'll, we'll be more willing to look at that and make sure that things are right. Meters are mechanical, <laughs> sometimes one way, sometimes the other. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, as you can see, it's gotten dark outside. For all of you that don't have flashlights on the front of your car, you can walk you out and it to you later. Uh, is there any new business to come before this meeting? Hearing none, um, as you heard from Nate, we've got an exceptional group of employees. Uh, the board of directors, we meet pretty often. We look at a lot of things, but 
without the employees and without management, not, we can't do it. They're the people that you see every day that get the things done, that keep your lights on, that are going to keep the broadband on. And again, I would like to have you give them a round of applause. Brian Bersing, are you floating around here? Okay, I'm here to announce the election results. Uh, we'll start uh, District 4. So Kay Cashian has a total of 116 votes. Jean Parks with 650 votes. Annie Simon with 190 votes. In District 5, Ann Young with 867 votes. And in District 6, Jim Huber with 874 votes. Okay, thank you, Brian, and thank you to the people who ran in District 4 that were not successful. We, we hope you continue your interest in the cooperative, and as always, and with anybody else, uh, with some notice, you're always welcome at our board meetings. Joe Bega, come on up. <laughs> Well, something like that. You know, before Joe got on the board, I kind of knew who he was, but I didn't know him. I mean, it's pretty hard to miss that big mop of white hair, you know, walking around. And Joe has got quite a, quite a storied, uh, storied uh, life. He went, he went to Alaska to teach school. He and his wife did, and they found out but that didn't work so good, so they bought a fishing boat and fished for several years, and then came back to the States and bought a farm over by Olivet, over in prime, prime well, prime, prime cow calf country and raising hay. And, you know, he's, he probably bought some of his windows when he bought glass. And he's the only member of our board that can read Hebrew. You guys didn't know that, did you? <laughs> Don't believe. I can read Hebrew as well as God can read his answer. <laughs> huh? Not lately. Not lately. Um, Joe has been an absolute delight to have on our board. As with all our board members, uh, he brings a unique set of life experiences and business knowledge. Um, he's kind of our, he used to be kind of our guru on solar until we got a little more into it. Because what have you got, 40 kW solar? 22, okay. Well, plus up north. 22 and there's Pepper. He also is our, uh, he's our Tesla owner. So he keeps us up on Teslas and electric, electric cars. So. He's kind of our, our go-to guy on, on renewables, and he kind of keeps us honest on some of that stuff once in a while. But he's like, all the rest of our board members bring unique experiences, and that's what, that's what makes our board work. I mean, if everybody had the same experience and knew the same thing, we'd only need one. It'd be a lot better. But anyway, Joe, we've got this plaque for you. <laughs> well, you don't have it yet, so you don't have it. <laughs> So I will read it, Joseph C. Bacon, 2017 to 2023, to Joe Bacon, for six years of dedicated service, during your tenure as a director of First Pepin Cooperative Services. We commend you for this effort and for the leadership you demonstrated from 2017 to 2023. Your knowledge of the electric utility industry and your invaluable support of the cooperative and its members are very much appreciated. Thank you. Presented March 30th, 2023. <laughs> okay, Nate, you get to do the where? You're right behind me. 
my eyesight. I, I passed my driver's license test. I got peripheral vision, but I don't have any in the back of my head. So we're going to draw the door prices. Would you like the green Karnak? We got two hundred dollar ones here. Ah, Mark Turner. Yeah, <laughs> Marvin Maxwell. Jerry Zimmer. Gary Dreyer. Great job. Draw another one? Okay. <coughs> Shelton Hoover. Where are you, Shelton? Way in the back. One more. Tolvin Edom. tickets, so we'll have 12 tickets we'll give up, but there will be three of these, to the St. Paul Saints. So what you'll need to do, if you win this award, or win this uh, uh, door prize, is come up and talk to Lori. Uh, we will get in touch with you after this, and look at the dates uh, in March uh, and April, uh, or April and May, I should say, and uh, we can pick which date you want to go to the game. So we'll be four tickets, now you do know you'll have to have a passport to get into Minnesota, so it's a requirement. Charles Thompson. Robert Schwann. Dan number three, me, yes? No, Ronald Erickson. Here? Right there, okay, good, good. Congratulations, now what do we got? Fifty dollars, I thought you were gonna say we got 50 more. Okay, everybody's going. Charles Conroy. <laughs> Bill Warner. Richard Koopman. Myrna Wakefield. <laughs> Joe Bacon. Oh. <laughs> okay, we got three mugs over here. Joe, Joe, I think that was a mistake. You were supposed to get a mug. No, I'm just <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. PL School. The Neen Street. Gary Brown. We got five fifty dollar ones left. John Bisto. He's 
Dirk Brzezowski. Did I get that right, Dirk? That's correct. Robert Sodden, S O D O N. <laughs> Carl Henderson. One more. One more. One more. Gary Allen. I need a motion to destroy the ballots. Regent Card, got one. We got a second. All in favor, read your cards. All opposed, read your cards. Carry. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>